There's a total split on a patient, in fact, in the second war as well. I don't think you understand by the end of this what's meant by damage control. Recognize when it's applicable and have a strategy for the management of the multiple injured patients. We're going to look at how we've come to where we are now because this is an evolving situation. We're going to look at the question of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, what damage control the Phoenix actually means and who will benefit from it. When I started in medicine in the 1970s, this was holy risk. You couldn't operate on a patient with a femoral fracture because they were far too ill to operate on. If you did, you would kill them. So they were all treated in traction. And now I'm turning into an old man with no hair and why I've got my hair for a grave. I can actually admit to the fact that when I started, femoral fractures were treated in traction. That was the end of it. It was no harm. In the early 1980s, people began to question that. They've been questioning it a bit for a long time, but the questioning really began to gather momentum. <clears throat> and studies were done that show that that was just plain wrong. And this study by me in 1986, look at the difference in mortality in patients with federal fractures operating upon and those who weren't. There was no question that they needed to be fixed. So suddenly we went from everything gets that interaction to everybody gets fixed. Bowen <laughs> Johnson produced his shameful paper in the late 1980s where he randomised patients with multiple injuries, including a family fracture, to early or late fixation, and they clearly showed a big difference in mortality and the incidence of ARDS in the patients who had early fixation. So, we changed to the concept of early total care. We went from the patient is too sick to operate on to this patient. I remember having this argument with an anesthetist. This patient is much too sick not to operate on. If we don't fix these fractures, we're going to kill him or her. Just a complete change. We went around. Patient came in at 6 o'clock and at 2 in the morning you'd still be there putting nails into their final fractures to get them all stabilised. And if things improve, our moving mortality rates didn't improve. But, <coughs> groups in Europe, particularly in Pape, began to notice that in some of these patients they developed pulmonary problems. I made a paper that caused a huge amount of controversy in 93 and showed the patients who'd been nailed developed an increased incidence of ARDS. And at meetings all over Europe and in the States, there was a great row going on about who was right. The Americans fix everything, and the Europeans, if you fix everything, you're going to give people problems. Because the Americans went on to use money to say it didn't matter. The development of ARDS was related to chest trauma, not whether or not they got a femoral fracture. And bones. So it doesn't matter how you fix the fracture, whether you know it or whether you place it, they're just as likely to develop problems. What we didn't realise at the time, but understand now, was that actually both groups were correct. It is the severity of the trauma that matters, and it doesn't matter whether you put a nail or a plate on a femoral fracture in a multiple injured patient. But in some very badly injured patients, doing too much surgery is a bad thing. Early fracture mortality does, uh, but, sorry, fixation does reduce mortality, but excessive surgery can kill the patient. And we now understand a bit more about it because of this we understand about systemic inflammatory response syndrome. It's the physiological response to an injury. It can happen 
where we saw that they can also happen if somebody gets a severe infection or a septicemia. It's a series of complex cellular and molecular events, and as an orthopedic surgeon, I don't really understand that much about what's going on. But it's the sort of thing you learn about a medical school you forget. Flanking cells, recruiting in response to, uh, to uh, mediators released at the site of injury. I'm speaking all about that. But we also now we know something called CARS, compensating, compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome, which balances up SIRS and O2 sites of the C school. So if we think, and I'm a very simple chap as an orthopedic surgeon, so I like to think in simple terms, but we have a lot of side cells activated by a number of factors, including TFNA, TFN-alpha, intermediate 1 and 6, and on the other side, CARS, which suppresses cells, which is activated by a whole lot of organs and leukins, and you need to know what they are. If you go down on the other side, you're going to develop multi-organ failure, including ARDS and renal failure. If you go down on the other side, then you're not mounting enough of an inflammatory response and you risk getting infection. Uncontrolled systemic inflammatory response can give you over your biological reserves, you'll get microvascular injury, you'll get leakage through the vessels, you'll get insufficient edema, the organs will stop working all over the place, and you end up with multi organ failure. Now, service is defined internationally as any two of these things. And I'll let you read them for themselves, they're not very complicated. <laughs> But there are degrees of systemic inflammatory response. And even if you get measles, you're going to get two of those. The swine flu, I know, is a bit topical here at the moment. So what happens when you're injured? Here comes the injury, you have got to develop cells, and in a normal, moderate sized injury, your anti inflammatory response kicks in and you remain in balance. So you survive. But if it's a much bigger injury, you have a more inflammatory response, and it may be that that inflammatory response will not be counteracted by your counter-inflammatory response, and so you will tip yourself into multi-organ failure. How much of each of those you need tip yourself one way or the other is genetically determined and it varies from individual to individual. So if you don't have enough cars, a relatively smaller inflammatory response may tip you over. And most people who practice trauma for a long time can think of at least one case where a relatively minor injury, say an isolated femoral fracture, led to the death of a patient through an inflammatory response. I've certainly seen that once in my life. <coughs> so what happens with trauma? You have the first hit. That's the injury caused by the actual accident. We can't do anything about that at all. We have the patient response. A better patient who responds well, but a better patient who's going to have a tendency to get an overwhelming systemic inflammatory response. And we can't control that. But what we can control is what happens afterwards, the second hit. Because surgery is more trauma. If we take that patient to theaters and operate on them for 12 hours, all they're doing is injuring them even more, even though they're trying to do the right thing. So, here's our injured patient again. Here's their systemic inflammatory response. They balance that up neatly. And now we take them to theatres and we get another day of hit. And once they can't balance it up, and we've just killed the patient. Not a good thing to do. So, in an at risk patient, we want to keep our second hit to a minimum in order to save life. Do as little as you can get away with while keeping them alive. How do you know if a patient's at risk? Well, 
we use our factors, we'll give us a clue the applications of this. But the single biggest factor is almost certainly whether they're acidotic or not, whether they've got a basic set. There is a way of measuring it, which is interleukin 6, but you can't get a rapid result of interleukin 6. This is still a research tool, but I think we're probably only a year or two off now being able to send the blood down to the lab and get the response in half an hour. This is the work done by Deacon Lewis and Leeds and shows that the line in red is their serves, the level of serves, and the line in blue is the level of interleukin 6. And you can see how those match up very neatly in the acute phase. They both go up together, they both come down together. So what is damage control? Damage control comes from the Navy. It's about keeping the ship afloat, keeping it floating without actually repairing it completely. You're doing whatever you need to do in order to keep things running. Maintain maximum fighting capability in naval terms, maintain maximum physiological capability in body terms. Because the Navy are trying to avoid this, turning into this. So save life, and if you can save limb, don't provoke multi-organ failure. So you only do the life-saving surgery, you stabilize that just because stability is good, but you don't necessarily want to stabilize them definitively. And you don't do any further surgery until the risk of multi-organ failure has gone away. In practical terms, that's about four or five days. And from our point of view, what that means is stabilization fast. And the only way I know is stabilize the fracture in 20 minutes, because I'm not that good on put nails down anything that fast, is to use external fixators. You don't have to move them on, but you do have to stabilize the fractures. Here's an interesting, another study from Pete Giannoudis, which shows that a group in red had primary fixation and a group in blue had um, primary external fixation. Okay? And you can see that the group in green with the external fixators, their interleukin 6 levels do not rise. These are very similar in injured patients. Whereas the group that had primary fixation, look what happens to their interleukin 6 levels. They go right up. The group who had external fixations went down to have secondary fixation several days later, and on this occasion, they do not get this rise in interleukin 6. So it demonstrates that the effects of the trauma are summate. You get the trauma from the first hit, and then you get the trauma from the surgery together. And that's not a good thing. So, here's the trauma, our first hit. We want to resuscitate the patient. If that patient is completely stable and there's no risk of developing systemic inflammatory response problem, then we can go for early total care. We're not throwing the concept of early total care out of the window. The fractures need stabilizing. And if you can do so quite safely, then by all means do. But in patients where we're not sure, we will come back another day and get more than me. But in patients who are clearly unstable, well they need damage control. So we're going to externally fix their fractures in the theatre, do everything else that needs to be done to save their life, and then we're going to take them to the intensive care unit for the next four or five days. We're going to get everything under control, and we're going to bring them back, and if necessary, take the external fixators off, and do our definitive fixation. There are those patients who are at death's door in extremis. You can't even take them to theatre, they need to be in an intensive care unit. Take the external fixators, to them in the intensive care unit, and put on as little as you can get away with. Pin inside, bar connecting them is a lot better than nothing. Stable fractures will stop bleeding and they will get the patient better. There are a lot of patients, so those ones they will say, we're not quite sure. 
an assassination, could no way of leaving, and then stop and have another look. If they have completely stabilized, you can take them to theaters and you can start fixing things. Definitively. But have a plan. And at the end of each stage, say so we're going to fix their femur first, because that's the way it needs to be done. At the end of the femur, in terms of the anesthetist, is this patient still stable? And those showing the signs of developing acidosis, is there a problem? Can you take the car? Can you carry on with any cardiomyopathy? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then just transfer it over and treat the rest of the fractures with a damage control strategy. If they're safe to carry on, do another bit. Stop, ask yourself how we carry on. Just because it's safe at the beginning of the first operation doesn't mean it's still going to be okay at the end of the fifth one. If on the other hand you're not sure or you're unstable, play the safe, external fixators, in field. So ladies and gentlemen, our current understanding is that trauma precipitates systemic inflammatory response. Too much trauma, and that includes surgery, causes life organ failure. So that in patients who you perceive to be at risk, keep the second hit to a minimum by a quick external fixation and avoidance of further surgery for at least four days. Until you're told by the intensivist, you can go ahead. For patients who are not at risk, early total care remains an excellent way to treat them. But let me issue a warning to you all. In my career time, since I was a junior doctor, our strategy has changed three times. We've gone from two sick to operate on to too sick not to have an operation, to some of them need an operation, but some of them all of these stabilisation, but we need to select our patients very carefully and decide whether we're going to go for early time to care or damage control. I've got another 10 or 12 years left in me just for that, as all the periods, and I'm willing to bet that we'll have another change in that time. So just because you're up to date now doesn't mean you're going to be up to date in a decade's time. So you must watch this space very carefully. All the major revisions of policy seem to me to be inevitable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There 
have the historical spores, anatomical spores, and combined spores. The historical spores use physiological monitors to assist the patient initially and to take a decision about, uh, it is the hospital assessment to take a decision whether to uh, transfer this patient to a different from a center or not. Uh, one of the main specializations for the uh, GCS to assist the uh, conscious level and the magnitude of brain injury, trauma score, revised trauma score uses the GCS plus the uh, other physiological parameters like the uh, systolic blood pressure, respiratory rate. The anatomical scores as the aggravated injury scale, injury severity score, new injury severity score, and these are uh, used with predictive value regarding the outcome, the hospital stay, the ICU stay, and the complications of the multiple injury patient. And lastly, the combined, the combined physiological and anatomical scores, the dress for the trauma injury severity score, it used for the study of the outcome of trauma patients. The most famous anatomical one is the injury severity score. Uh, the body has been divided in six anatomic areas: head and neck, face, chest, abdomen, and pelvic contents, extremities, and external. We use the abbreviated injury scale. It is a scale of one to six. is included in this scale and it has its weight. One minor, two hundred, three serious, four severe, five critical, and six unsurvived. The injury scores for the sum of squares of the highest aggregate injury grades of the three most severely injured areas. The minimum score being between and the maximum is 75. Survivor is written with the injury score above 40. This is an example to understand what is the injury severity score. These are the six anatomic regions. And we take the highest three regions affected, the aggravated injury scale, and we take the square of these top three, and uh, we have the sum of the most uh, highest three regions. The new Score, it considers the three highest scores regardless of the anatomic areas. For example, in the injury death score, uh, if we take the head injury, the abdominal injury, and the skeletal injury at the past, in the human death score, if we have there is two high, higher skeletal injury than the abdominal injury, we will take these two skeletal injuries. Okay? We will take the three higher injuries regardless of the anatomic region. We go through the management of polytrauma patients. The treatment of polytrauma patients is challenging. Why? This is because it is a life-threatening situation and injury in management may lead to serious complications. So our principles of management are simultaneous assessment and resuscitation and establishing the surgical priorities. The periods of management acute for resuscitation phase this is the golden few hours after trauma. Primary for stabilization phase, it is the first 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, and secondary for regeneration period, up to 10 days, and lastly the tertiary for rehabilitation period after the 10th day. In the acute period, we apply the protocol of the ADS protocol with primary surveying, aiming at Assessment and resuscitation at the same time. The patient's human area is unstable. We should limit our diagnostic procedures to what is necessary for the diagnosis of the dynamic instability. We should do only the brain x ray chest, AP view of the pelvis, ultrasound examination of the animal abdomen, and screening lateral view of the cyst spine to protect the cyst spine during resuscitation and airway management. We have the first priority injuries at this stage derived threatening injuries. And we do only derive threatening surgery to stop massive hemorrhage, either external or internal, inside chest, intracranial, retrocranial, or natural pelvis, 
और इन ऑपरेशन की उन्होंने चलाई जाती है। We have have learned from previous lectures about the protocol of punishment in Russia. Please show us how we go. We should take a decision. You will be suspicion. Must address the protocol of suspicion. Maximum be suspicion. This allows lots of students do not necessarily X-ray chest abdominal swab to take a decision to put in the posted tube or laparotomy. If negative, we should always think of the pelvis as a source of meaning and take the decision with tender binder or anxious implant. If not, we should do after the and even send them back. To the in the final stabilization period, all the functions have been stabilized. We go through the acceptable survey. We have now time to examine the patient in the industry, to rule out the diagnostic procedures, and we have now the second priority instances. They are the delay, primary, or general surgery regarding the other injuries, not the life threatening injuries. We can deal with. Regarding the muscles in the injuries, we can now do the new serial surgery. First of all, the priorities come for the open injuries. Regarding the long bone fractures, the priorities are fractured with component injuries to major basis, fractured with severe component syndrome, fractured with open soft tissue injuries. Then come the improved. Fractures, closed diagonal fractures, tendon pain injuries, and unstable spine fractures. It's very really important to notice that the skin damage is aggravated in multiple injured patients with generalized hypoxia. So, hospital injury requires further diagnosis and direct treatment. We have the number of extreme severity score for assessment of the severely injured brain. And as part of uh, setting of blood figures and creation, for Parkinson's syndrome as well, the, uh, is, uh, may be overlooked in the uh, multiple major or polyphonic patient, generalized hypoxia and need to be reversed with damage at much lower compartment rate. So, in that, we need to get such a thing as well. In open fractures, we should treat all kinds of fractures during this period. Extensive dividing is needed, plus a shadowing and skill fixation of the fracture. Regarding the open joint injuries, the initial treatment is dividing, reconstruction of the articular surface using linear invasive muscle defenses, bilateral screws, and cross articular external fixation. Defensive internal fixation should be delayed to the latest time, not done in this stage of the point of our patient. Regarding the closed shaft fracture, the principle is to provide a different or at least for stable fixation at this stage. The priority is for lower limb first, pelvis, spine, and then upper limb. Where should we fix the fractures at this stage? Lower soft tissues are susceptible to continual damage, especially in the lower end by the femoral and tibial fractures. So, the femoral fractures can represent a special organ in the compromised patient because of the soft tissue injury. The continual soft tissue injury initiates the systemic inflammatory reaction and may lead to uh, systemic complications due to the release of inflammatory cells. High number of patients have developed a survival condition as we learned from the previous lecture. So, if an epithetically ill patient, temporary stabilization of biopsychic should be done. Then come the uh, reconstruction of pelvic injuries and unstable spine injuries. We pass the primary unit and we come down to the second day or initiation period from the third to the tenth day. The point of prevention of secondary organ failure. 
by the extensive divide of short digital rules and the generation of safety for sight. Seven deliberations can be done at this stage, as one will and also rules in other extremely and complex joint reconstructions. The first general reconstruction period after, after the next day, we can do final reconstructive operations like all grafting, species of tissue reconstructions, and all related post-training procedures. Physical rehabilitation and social reintegration should take place at this stage. We should now talk about the special cooling prohibition. What is the special cooling prohibition? Or what about the special cooling prohibitions? These are patients with different physiological parameters than the adult cooling prohibition patients. The pediatric trauma patient is a special cooling prohibition. The pregnant trauma patient and the, the geriatric trauma patient. We should have considerations regarding this patient. In the pregnant trauma patient, we should be at saving the mother and the fetus. There are physiological variations during pregnancy that the mother will lose uh, up to one third of the circulatory volume without uh, changing in the blood pressure of the heart rate. So we should consider this. In the the geriatric trauma, the intensivity score is different. Mortality occurs at lower levels of intensivity score. There is more evidence that should be considered. Uh, the past results of poly trauma have been discussed in the previous lecture. I just remind you that we have two basic elements in the poly trauma. Shock, intermittent acidosis, hypothermia, and ultimate cardiopathy, and the inflammatory enzyme will be released in perimetrium theater, intermittent systemic inflammatory response in the realm, or immune suppression. So our aim is, or our goal in treatment is to prevent these complications. How do we prevent this? As mentioned before, there is a risk hit by the trauma. The physiological reserve of the patient and the second hit. Second hit may be done by us. The second hit may be due to the surgical intervention. So we should minimize our surgical intervention in such patients to prevent addition of the uh, surgical treatment and to prevent these complications. The complications of the treatment are cardiopathy. Sustained electric response in drug and powerful organ failure, other respiratory stress syndrome, immune suppression and sepsis, DVD and pulmonary poison. The damage control surgery, we all now know what is damage control. For trauma surgeons, damage control is to achieve initial injury control. And the reasons with major hemorrhagic injuries will not survive complex procedures such as reconstruction and fixation of complex intra-fibral fashion. So the operation must be more short. Patient transfer to ICU, correct heart therapy, acidosis, metabolic pains, and then after correction we can do the definitive surgical procedure. It is a stage approach to polyclonal patient. The principles of damage control are control of damage prevention and intermediate protection from further injury. For us as hospital surgeons, control bleeding, nerve separation and development, fascial need, and provisional fixation of fractures. To summarize, the management of cooling trauma is initial resuscitation and assessment. If resuscitation is successful and the patient is stable, we can go to defensive surgery and early treatment care. If the resuscitation, uh, the patient is not stable and there is neurodynamic instability, we go to the medium while saving surgery and then we go to the damage control regarding provision and fixation of fracture, giving the patient the chance of survival, admission to ICU and then the of surgery after, after stabilization of the patient. The medical operation is safe for the patient. The medical surgeon must make 
sufficient safe for the other patient. A view of my work, this is us at University Hospital where I work. We have the tournament that is a very center for compromised patients. Compromised uh, patients are referred to us from the area of Asyut and other areas around in Upper Egypt. We have a very huge amount of agents. The annual total load of uh, the last year, the admissions was 10,145 patients. The surgically managed patients were 5,970 patients. Of them, 1,627 patients were polypromatized, and we have a mortality rate of 6% in polypromatized patients. We come to the end of our talk. I just remind you the objectives were the relevance of the subject, how to define polypromatized patients, how to assess the severity, the first course of management, the special polypromatization, of the security complications, and the damage to both polypromatized Thank you very much. Chest. What do you think? Uh, 
that big confusion I agree with you. That big confusion I is that what do you think of Oh, the two-hour sensitivity is pretty asymmetric. It's a chance that it's a moral assessment. Is that what we're going to ask? Where is that worry? Yes. Okay. Here's the key mark. It's a chance that it really is near the mass to be intact. There's no time that's going to fly. Right? Why is that even piece of the problem? There is not a severe story in this time. And we do compile the fashion management. Is everyone familiar with the part of fashion management? Uh, part of the thing is well. Okay, you should take the compile the fashion, subtract it from the entire solid fashion, which gives you the compile the fusion fashion. If that's less than 30, you're in trouble. Please don't compile the fashion 60 seconds. If you remember, it's diastolic with 80. Who's in trouble? Okay? Right. The latest is Kenya, here is the Tibia, this is an open area here. It's a brain free area. He's got a load of parts of the area of the Tibia. We've looked at that very carefully, there's no parts of the area of the Tibia. There's another thing about that on the shoulder. He's got the parts, this is actually okay. But he has got that chemical fracture and a scapular fracture. But he's not got the vascular problem. And there's only four of us handed on the cake. Okay, here you are, this is the point. He's got a major chest injury. He's got an open 